I'm George Galloway, and I present Kali Mahorra on Al Maidin Television. Here we are in London. I speak my words freely, either in Parliament, on television, here on the streets of London. Kali Mahorra means free words. That's what I speak. So Kali Mahorra is a two-way conversation. Check it out on Al Maidin Television. Welcome to Kale Mahorra with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, coming to you from London and unusually discussing London. Well, Britain, at least. Britain is in the grip of a snap general election, the third general election in four years. This just four years after we passed a law making it mandatory for a parliament to last five years. This is our third in four years, which in a way exemplifies the current instability in the British political system. Yes, you heard that right. Instability in Britain. It's the kind of thing we used to look do down our nose to other countries about. Now, it could scarcely be a more important general election. If the Conservatives under Prime Minister Boris Johnson win, Britain will leave the European Union, probably by the end of this year, but certainly by the end of January next year. If the Liberal Democrats won the general election, Brexit, Britain's exit from the European Union would be cancelled altogether. If Labour wins the general election, well, it's a bit too complicated to discuss in the time available. We might still leave the European Union, but more likely we would remain in it. So three different Brexit policy policies in what is being billed as the Brexit general election. Labour doesn't want it billed as that. Labour wants to talk about the manifold failures of the Conservative government not just over the last four years, but they've actually been in power since 2010, admittedly for a short period of that in coalition with the Liberal Democrats. It's been an era of austerity, savage cuts in public expenditure, savage reductions in the living standards of ordinary people. You can see why Labour wants the election to be fought on that. On the other hand, Britain did vote to leave the European Union in 2016, but that has been continually frustrated by a parliament overwhelmingly made up of people who opposed that decision in the Brexit referendum. And all the signs are that by and large on the opinion poll data we have so far, Boris Johnson is comfortably ahead. In fact, in the latest opinion poll, very comfortably indeed, landslide majority uh, territory. That's, of course, uh, a long way out from the polling. The polling is not until the 12th of December, the first December election for almost 100 years. And I'm just saying, on that occasion, almost 100 years ago, Labour ended up as the government, the very first Labour government was elected as a result of the election in December of 1923. Now, there are many distinguished experts, political campaigners, political experts in the audience, and one or two enthusiastic amateurs. I would say like me, as I normally do, but I'm a bit more than an enthusiastic amateur when it comes to general elections. I've fought in every general election since 1964, when I was 10 years old in short trousers. And the windows of our small council municipal house were blackened by gigantic posters of the then Labour leader, Harold Wilson. And I haven't sat out a general election ever since. And I'm not sitting out this one, but I'm not going to speak about my own general election contest. I'm going to ask some of our uh, experts, starting with you, madam, as you have the, uh, the microphone, how do you see 
Britain's snap general election. Assalamu alaikum. Normally was responded by a group of Londoners with prego, which is people from Sardinia will say a prayer. May we all be at peace. It took so long for us to be able to unite. Every, every membrane, be it intercellular or intercultural or be it in a society, is a point of contact, is what we do with point of contact. It took us so long to have Northern Ireland, Ireland, Scotland, England, finding a point of contact and Europe. And the general election as is presented, many young people who are not very happy about the fact that we don't have enough options are actually voicing the fact that we are in the 21st century and we are due to have new options because this binary thinking, you know, is either or is limiting us. And I feel like as quirky as we are here, we can come out with something new. And the 12th of December perhaps will present us with a new perspective because we are not satisfied with elections as such. Young people want to have the right to vote. They have, in protests, voiced their voice. And they also want to have the right to be elected. Are we about the 21st century to change everything? And I think that's the question. Because here we have actually have done many transformations. And then we are able, you know, the quirkiness about here is the fact that we had slavery and unslavery. We had the suffragettes. We have revolutions. We had change. We had social transformations. And we are able to take that forward. As you mentioned, in England, the tendency was to look and comment on other countries and think, how can possibly democracy go backwards? And what's happening to us now? We are the most, in London, the most multicultural society in the world. We have a complementarity to address. We have technology of advancement and austerity, on the other hand, when people feel they are not able to mobilize because they have to think of how do I pay my university fees and at the same time survive? How do I get into politics? And this is the time for change, radical change for all of us. Uh, James, you are uh, a candidate in the general election, an independent candidate, as foreshadowed by the last speaker. You're the I think third youngest at the age of 19 uh, candidate in the general election. Are you reflecting also uh, what our previous guest said, that the binary left-right Labour Tory uh, dichotomy is uh, somehow limiting and is that view shared by other young people, do you think? I think it is, George. Um, and I think one of the key factors in that is sort of the rise of social media and the digital age, you know, no longer if you want to see what's going on in the world and the country, do you have to buy a tabloid or broadsheet? It's available in so many different formats. In fact, hardly, one, hardly anyone now does. Well, quite right, indeed. And most young people don't watch even a single hour of the BBC in a whole week. No, quite. They can get it all from their Instagram stories or Twitter moments or, or what have you. Um, but I think that also then does ebb away at the traditional party loyalties. And I think you can see that in the 2019 uh, European elections, where the Brexit party, a party that at the time was just 10 weeks old, completely topped the poll, you know, by a mile. Um, and, you know, just uh, took everyone, I think, by complete surprise. Uh, in where I live in Kingston, which is usually a Liberal Democrat, Conservative sort of swing area, the Conservatives got a mere 8% of the vote, down 30% from the general election two years before it. And so I think this is the most volatile election we've seen for a long time. And I want to touch on the lady's point about unity, and I quite agree with her that, um, you know, it's a, a great thing to, to be united and, and to be peaceful. But I, I fear that we'll be back in this very same uh, uh, room discussing the very same issue again next March at this rate because since the European referendum result the country has only got ever more divided uh, and I think we'll end up in a very similar situation that we have now where you won't have any sort of strong government in place um, and by yeah next March I think we'll probably be back here well I'll make a note election. in my, <laughs> my diary uh, you are uh, uh, how shall I say a conservative with a small c at least uh, from the Bruges group, so the European Union is a very important issue for you. To what extent do you think Boris Johnson will succeed in making this the Brexit election rather than an election about other things? 
He already has. The, the media are talking about it, this being the Brexit referendum, the Brexit election. We've already had the referendum and another election and now another election, all to implement the decision that was taken on the 23rd of June, over three years ago now. And it's Parliament that's been standing in the way of delivering what the people clearly voted for and what you yourself, George, campaigned for, as, as I did for, for many, many years. And really, this is an opportunity for this country to finally have its own. Boris Johnson is making it clear that Brexit is the key choice, is the key issue facing us. And from there, all other things are then possible because once we leave the European Union, we become a democratic, self-governing nation and countries can then, we can make our own choices. Jeremy Corbyn, he had his manifesto in 2017 and that was the called the post, sort of first post-Brexit manifesto. All the, many of the policies he was advocating, whether that was the renationalisation of the railways or the water utilities, was only possible if we're outside of the European Union. And fully ending austerity is only possible once we have con fully control of our own finances and our own economic policy, which is again only possible once we're out of the EU. And this election, it may well be divisive, but this is a good opportunity because we're seeing the breakdown of people's traditional party loyalties and people voting on their values, what they want for their community. And people are no longer locked into their class of how they're voting. We saw previous elections, places that were uber middle class, like Canterbury voting Labour and working class areas like Stoke voting Conservative because people's values are now being expressed above all else. And this is something to welcome. And yes, it may be divisive, the election, but that's a good thing because we're testing ideas and people are having their voice and the, old, the outcome, I think, will be quite clear that Boris Johnson will win by a significant majority, like you said, a landslide, and from there all things are possible. But whatever happens, it will be our choice, and hopefully it would lead to a Brexit, which is something I fundamentally and passionately believe in, because from there all other things are possible because we'd be self-governing and we can make the decisions ourselves. I see from your badge, sir, that you're a Labour uh, supporter. Uh, let me ask you uh, to take the floor uh, and maybe refer to this point. The manifesto that Labour stood on in 2017 was massively popular. Labour added millions of votes, got 40% of the vote, the biggest increase in the Labour vote since 1945. Absolutely. But you've ditched that now. Uh, you promised to respect the referendum result in 2017, but you haven't respected it. Will uh, that I, cost you? Oh, no, I'll, I'll, be, I'll, I'll be able to differ with you because I think uh, the respect uh, to those who voted uh, to leave is there in, in, in our uh, plan for... Another uh, referendum. Uh, another referendum, uh, <laughs> which then... Uh, provides an opportunity for people to see what would be what would Britain be like uh, if it goes a no deal as it been proposed by Boris Johnson. Well, that's not true. And, He's got and, a deal. Uh, He's already well, signed it. No, but no, but I, I think the colleague here have just mm. indicated that they will come out of uh, of the European Union if they have a majority without a yeah. deal. No, but, I, I, but uh, uh, we could park no deal because there now is a deal agreed between the British government and the EU. Possibly, but if, 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 if Boris Johnson gets a majority in the House of Commons, uh, uh, and I will want to come back on that democratic issue, uh, if, if he gets a, 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 a majority in the House of Commons, he will ditch that. We know how, how his tactics, we know how reliable, or I should say unreliable he is, he has never said anything and stuck to it. He, he's, he's just all over the place with his uh, ideas and how he tricks people. He does not keep his word. You know, the, the man cannot, the, the, cannot, the cannot, no, the, cannot, the, the, the gentleman's cannot, right, isn't he? Cannot, I mean, cannot, Boris Johnson's lied cannot, to everyone in, throughout his life. This is the man, he's, he's remained this is the man, this is the man, this is the man, I didn't interrupt you. Uh, this is the man that stood and the background, uh, uh, there is a bag, and his background as a bus saying to people there will be £350 million every week for the national health. Actually, it's £363 million. Well, OK, so, so he, he was correction. lying. He was he, lying. He was undercounting uh, it by you know, £13 I, I, million. I, I, And one a will week. not forget the divisive uh, uh, issues that, uh, that Boris stood on the ground 
uh, on his soapbox in 2016, claiming that will be 60 million Turks hidden in the way of Britain. Uh, so it, the, the man is absolutely a charlatan. It cannot be trusted. It cannot be, uh, 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 you know, uh, be believed in anything. I no, want to I come. I would. Not, I would like to come back on a point about democracy. Democracy is what practiced by the House of Commons. It actually that it is simple and basic job to hold the power to account, and that is what it did. I don't accept that we now because we're coming out of Europe, we gain our democracy. There was always democracy in the House of Commons. If they choose to ignore that, then they are not worthy to be in the House of Commons at all. So I, I wouldn't take lessons from, and for, about democracy from a conservative party that actually want to ignore 16 million people that voted to remain in Europe. Yeah. We want 17.4 we, 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 to have their say. Well, to, for Labour, the, Labour, all, all Labour MPs well, are Labour is offering, sir, Labour, Labour is offering. Well, there are, there are colleagues from the Conservative Party actually took the side of Labour and voted against your and government. they're going to be out of the House of Commons well, in, in, in a month's time. Yeah, and that's why you call democracy, is it? So well, the, the people are the, the people going will to decide. vote that. The people will decide. <laughs> I don't actually buy that it is a foregone conclusion that Conservative will win. Had the 2017 election uh, lasted for another week, we would have won. We would have won because we had a strong uh, uh, manifesto and we had a strong leadership. People trusted, trusted what uh, uh, Jeremy Copen say because he has a credibility. He stands on principles and that is something absent nowadays from the political uh, uh, field. Okay, we'll come back to you. Uh, you're a communist, uh, I'm assuming, uh, therefore, that you support Brexit, but a different kind of Brexit, perhaps, to the one Boris Johnson has in mind. Tell us. Well, there's a, there's a few issues around that. So one is this, actually, the idea of democracy, if I can just touch on that. These gentlemen talk about democracy. Democracy for who? Your Labour Party members can't even follow your own manifesto. You were saying people trusted Jeremy Corbyn. Maybe they trusted him when in the manifesto it said they would respect the result of the referendum. And your own Labour Party, Parliamentary Labour Party, couldn't abide by that. You had MPs saying they wanted to undo it while in the Parliamentary Labour Party, while claiming to respect democracy, while claiming to respect the wishes of the new mass influx to the Labour Party who helped shape it. I don't need to go on too much about Conservative Party, whether the working class can trust them. Uh, I hope most of them should be able to make up their own mind. I think people are desperate now that uh, Johnson will be able to get any kind of Brexit through because they've seen over the past three years such backstabbing, such treachery, so many lies Democracy, we get to vote every few years for people that don't represent our interests in a House of Commons that is filled with people that, frankly, most working class people have no respect for, who absolutely detest them because they make a mockery of the idea of democracy that we're meant to respect. And coming on to Brexit, I don't actually support the deal because I think it's a Brexit in name only. I think the European Union is primarily an economic union. It's one designed to bind all the countries in Europe together because they were weakened after World War II. And it was actually economics that drove the Brexit vote. So you had one section of the Tory party and their supporters, their backers, rich, wealthy, influential people, and another section of the Tory party and another section of rich, wealthy, influential people that couldn't quite agree whether they'd be better off in the single market or better off outside of it. And what the single market actually does is it changed the working class of Europe and it changed the working class of the world to a system which ruthlessly exploits them, if not through economics, then through outright wars, domination and other oppression. So I want to see a complete end to the European Union, not staying within the customs union. I think that's uh, a 
almost a get out of jail free card. And I think it's an absolute shame that working people don't have anyone really they can turn to, um, apart from a few places where some independent candidates are standing, I think. Uh, working class people can't turn to the Conservative Party, really. I think they may resort to, out of desperation for getting any kind of Brexit, they can't turn to the Labour Party. They've seen how the Labour, Parliamentary Labour Party treats the ideas of the membership and the working class with absolute contempt. And I think only the most deluded uh, middle class people can turn to the Liberal Democrats. And as a student, I mean, you'd have to pay me a lot of money uh, about the tune of £36,000 to vote for the Liberal Democrats after their betrayal in 2010. This is a reference to their betrayal on university fees. They and said they would it's, it's uh, not just university fees. And, sh and they, in fact, voted to triple them. And the Liberal Democrats have actually voted, uh, certainly Joe Swinson, the new leader of the Liberal Democrats, has voted more in line with the Tories than some Conservative some Party conservative, yeah. members. <laughs> so, Quite so. Uh, Mark Wadsworth, you're, uh, like me, a veteran of uh, these things. How does the election look to you so far? Well, it's uh, crucial that we get Corbyn in. I've got my criticisms of the Labour leadership and some of the things they've done. You were done. expelled under his leadership. I was expelled. Uh, in the same way as that you're not allowed back in, that Jackie Walker was expelled, Chris Williamson has been banned from standing as a candidate, and he's a sitting MP, the most loyal Jeremy Corbyn MP in the country. It's very Ken magnanimous of you then, out. still to be supporting Mr Corbyn. Tell us Yeah, why. because we support him for the party, what it stands for, and how it came into being in 1900 as the voice in Parliament of the working class of working people in Britain. And if he doesn't win, I can't think of a Labour leader that has lost two elections and continued as leader. Kinnock went after, Neil Kinnock went after two elections. So well, that will be, be the end of the he'll, socialist he'll, project. He'll be gone, uh, well, it'll not be the end of the socialist project, it might be the end of In the, the Labour idea Party. that Labour uh, can deliver uh, socialism, yeah. And that would be a, a, a big tragedy. Um, you talked about the last time there was a, uh, an election in, in December, in December yeah. 1923. Yeah. That's what, when Shapoji uh, Sakalakwala, who was a uh, communist who stood for the Labour Party, lost his Battersea North seat, having won it in 1922, you'll be aware that there was another election in 1924. And I tend to agree with the uh, colleague, uh, the young colleague who is standing, that we could be here again next year having another election, Hope given so. how volatile the polls are. I love elections, so I'm hoping so. And, you know, if there's another hung parliament. Mm. And, uh, well, let's leave it at that for now. Yes. Uh, Ahmad Caballo, you're uh, uh, one of uh, Britain's star journalists and uh, broadcasters. We'll come to you in the second half after we've seen some very interesting Vox Pops. Much more coming up. You're watching Kali Mahorra with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, coming to you from London and discussing, unusually, Britain and the general election, in the midst of which we all are. We took the Kali Mahorra camera onto the streets of London to see what the people thought. Let's take a look. If there's a hung parliament, how do you think that might affect uh, policies in this country? Probably what's happening right now, which no one knows what's going on. So, like, as, you know, like we don't know what's going on. Like, when you look at politics, we don't know who's winning, who's losing, who's doing better, who's doing, you know. So as far as I know, I don't know. I don't know if there'll be much. I don't even know if you'll notice much of a difference, if there is. I think it's quite likely because I think a lot of people aren't happy with you know, the Tory government we've had, but also not enough people uh, really want to vote Labour. Um, I feel like it will further delay um, things that Parliament is trying to push forward, most importantly Brexit, um, as 
one government, Conservative, they can't seem to come to a decision about Brexit as it is, let alone a coalition government with two very similar but different um, agendas about Brexit. And yeah, I think it will just further delay the whole Brexit deal. Uh, given that there's a lot of uh, sort of right-wing opposition to Jeremy Corbyn, uh, do you think the establishment would let somebody like that become PM, even if he won a popular vote? Of course not, and that's because if the, Jeremy Corbyn it seems like he's a, a nice guy. It seems like he's a good guy, and in this country, I don't want to go into too much detail, but this country they don't want nice people running the country. They want greedy people. They want they want people like Boris Johnson running the country. People that have got a lot of dirt on their name. Uh, you know, understand people like. Tony Blair, they want them sorts of people, people that don't really have morals. And that's basically the big difference between, I'm not, like I said, I don't support any political party, but w one thing I see with Jeremy Corbyn, as opposed to a lot of them, like Theresa May and all these other people, is that Jeremy Corbyn seems like he's got a bit of em empathy. And I'd say the same about George Galloway. And that's why I think a lot of people don't like George Galloway, because George Galloway talks from a, a humane perspective rather than like economic, you know, so, Do you think that um, the result of the election might uh, lead to an, a new referendum in Scotland or Northern Ireland as well? It will be a catalyst uh, for sure uh, for uh, different re uh, referendums uh, across the UK. But I think definitely in with Northern Ireland it could cause problems. And also with, um, with Scotland as well because the SNP are again one of the parties that are definitely still want to remain in the EU. So I think it's definitely not out of the question uh, with both of those, uh, both those places, yeah. What a clever young man he was. <laughs> uh, now, uh, I didn't know that was coming up. I want to make that absolutely clear. Ahmed, you're uh, working on the general election. You're a red hot correspondent. Your uh, analysis, please, on how you think it's going so far. Well, it's, it's hard to read how it will go, but if we think back to the 2017 <coughs> general election and just how far Corbyn was behind and how close he came in the end, then he has a chance if he manages to widen the terms of debate and make it not just about Brexit. And he has an issue if he makes it just about Brexit because the Labour Party's position is still very <coughs> unclear on Brexit. You don't know where the leader himself stands. It looks like the rest of the parliamentary um, ministers uh, remain, so would they want to implement a, 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 a second referendum, would they really put a choice forward for a Brexit? That remains unclear. Um, in a personal perspective, I will be voting for Labour. I won't be doing it enthusiastically. Um, the reason for that is less about Jeremy Corbyn, more about the parliamentary Labour Party and the par Labour Party as in general. Me and you know that, that the Labour Party councils don't have a monopoly throughout the country and yet they implement austerity to the letter and blame the Conservative Party when many times they've got millions and millions of pounds in reserves. There seems to be um, the Labour Party establishment throws good politicians, good men under the bus. I'm looking at one, I'm sitting next to one. Um, what they did to Chris Williamson, the idea that Margaret Hodge is welcoming the Labour Party, but Chris She's one of the leading Israel supporters. Le one of the leading Israel supporters who, every time there's a microphone in front of her, uses an opportunity to attack her leader. But, but moreover, we get told by Liberal friends all the time about if the Labour Party came into power, if Jeremy Corbyn came into power, they'd do all these great things. I want to see if they'd actually live up to that. If this anti-war champion would really change the trajectory of British, British foreign policy, because what's the alternative? The Liberal Democrats, the Conservative Party, SNP. Um, so the, the, the SNP, they talk about Scottish independence, but my concern is, when did they ever say anything about foreign policy? Where, where was their statement about what happened in Bolivia? Where was their statement about what was going on in Venezuela? Mm -hmm. so, it's, so I want to see if, in the heart of empire, we can truly see a different change of direction from this disastrous foreign policy that has set us on this path for the last 20 years. Well, the establishment obviously fears that. Uh, Mike Pompeo, the US Secretary of State, 
was tape recorded saying that he would make sure that Corbyn had to run the gauntlet and that they would see what obstacles they could put in his way. The supporters of Israel are moving heaven and earth uh, to brand Corbyn as an anti-Semite. Uh, there's a talk of mass immigration of British Jews to Israel if Corbyn gets in and all that. So the establishment are afraid of this sea change that you want to see. There's not that much evidence, though, that such a sea change would happen. I mean, Corbyn now wants to stay in NATO, though he spent his lifetime calling for withdrawal from NATO. He now wants to keep nuclear weapons, having spent his lifetime trying to ban them. Uh, he effectively leads a party which clearly wants to stay in the European Union, having spent his uh, lifetime trying to leave it, uh, and so on. I could go on, believe me. Um, so isn't it the case for someone like you that you're choosing actually the lesser of two evils? Of course, evils? and that's what it's like in most Western democracies, mm. you choose the lesser of two evils. There is an argument, though, mm. that <clears throat> what he says and does as well as in opposition will be very different to when he sits in, the, in number 10 and has the power to implement those changes. Now, of course, solidarity is just talk, but it's still important. So it was important that when we saw what happened in Bolivia, Jeremy Corbyn made the statement that he made. Very good statement, yes. And it is important that when people are getting killed in Gaza, Jeremy Corbyn makes a statement. And, it, and it's the difference between him and Boris Johnson is the difference between night and day. And I find it a little bit funny that you, that as a conservative, you're using the argument of austerity to leave the European Union because it's not austerity that is driving, sorry, it's not um, the European Union that's driving austerity. It's an ideological thing that the Conservative Party has been committed to for a long period of time. Yeah, but it's an ideological thing that the, the European Union and the central bank and the fiscal rules all uh, guarantee austerity in of course, EU member countries. I'm not a supporter of the European Union. My only annoyance about this is the f we're in a particular time where there is a binary between left and right. I just want the right to be honest about why they want to leave the European Union. Don't wear the left's clothes and use the left's arguments to leave the European Union. Leave the European Union why because not, you why want... Why can't we agree? Why, as a Conservative, why can I not agree with the Communist gentleman's uh, analysis of the European Union about how it's a corporatist racket, that it's not there for working class people, that it's not there for a free market either, it's there to be enable those mm. who already have power... Yeah. Well, yeah, if, 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 uh, can can I, you, can I, you why can't we agree? You are talking about corporate. Which is, is yeah. whole which is what the European Union is all about. That's mm. what it's built <laughs> okay. on this basis of economics. Let me, break, let me break the news to you that if you don't have the microphone, <laughs> you will not, you'll not actually be recorded. Uh, uh, Ahmed, let me uh, yeah. hear from the gentleman in the middle who hasn't uh, spoken yet. How does the election look to you, sir? And nice to meet you, George. And first of all, may I wish you all the very best okay. uh, for, your, uh, for your election. Um, I don't want to beat around the bush too much, but what I'd like to, to say is that I'm a Frenchman and I've been living in the United Kingdom for 25 years. Um, I have never been unemployed. I've always been at work. I've always paid my taxes, uh, meaning I've contributed to the British economy. My wife is English, British. My children are British. And this whole Brexit debacle has been causing not just myself, but perhaps other uh, millions of Europeans around Britain uh, a lot of headaches, and, and for me in particular, uncertainty. You know, uh, it's been kind of a, a big cloud above my head. Um, but being a socialist and uh, being from the left, um, I really, um, I really agree with most of your point of views. Um, even a referendum, a, a referendum took place in in 2016, and I believe that obviously. It is, you know, it needs to be done. And uh, I'm not really, actually, as a matter of fact, probably a massive fan, actually, as a matter of fact, of the European project. And um, I, uh, you know, I, I... Well, let me uh, point out that uh, President Macron said he would never give the French a referendum on leaving the EU because he knows that they would vote to leave it. Indeed. Indeed. I mean, I, I agree with you. And... Um, 
um, I, I really believe that, uh, you know, these things probably need to be done. But I feel myself a bit more like perhaps an immigrant a little bit, because for me, it's been a very, very difficult thing this Brexit thing, living in this country for 25 years. And I was asking my wife, actually, actually yesterday, I said, where do we fall into this stuff? You know, and, uh, and uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I love Britain. Uh, my life is here. My life is not in France any longer. And uh, I just wish that whoever comes into power, that they can give people like me a bit more clarity, a bit more uh, sanctity about these things. Uh, on, on the other hand, with regards to your question about the, the election, I'm a socialist. The only thing I'd like to say, the last 10 years, the conservative, uh, the, the conservative have been in power. And uh, there has been sheer austerity. People are dying in the streets. Um, I do a bit of filming as well, and I've done, I've had a part in a, in a movie that's coming out next year called uh, Homeless Ashes. And it's about homelessness. And uh, so many people are living in the streets so many people are dying in the streets, so many food banks. And it's like, and it's like when, I, when I look at some of these conservative MPs going live on the TV and saying that it's probably the fault of the Labour Party, that the country needs these states, I just would like to remind people that in the last 10 years, the Tories have been in power. A very good point. A beautiful and unexpected uh, contribution. Thank you very much for that. Who else would like to uh, speak, madame? Please. We've heard from a young man. We should now hear from a young woman. I'm not very political or anything like that, so I don't really have much to say. But really, all it is is that it's very, very difficult for us guys because we've all grown up as a community, all different people from different countries, all around the world. We're all coming together now. And as we grow up now, we're just going to be segregated because obviously Labour and... Brexit, it's just we're going to be split up. It's, it's going to be very difficult for us to live because things are changing, things are different. Well, you know, it's the second time this uh, point has been made. You know, you, you can't have a, a general election without division um, because there is a tension between democracy and unity, uh, inevitably, because I have to vote for him or him. Uh, and I'm going to argue for him or him, uh, and others are going to do likewise, vice versa. The, the question really for me is, and this I'd like others to weigh in on too, you have to get what you voted for. Because if you don't get what you voted for, why would you keep voting? And if you don't keep voting, if you lose faith in democracy, what else is there? I mean, uh, we don't want to uh, be in a situation where uh, we lose faith in our ability to choose our direction. And that's the big dilemma that many of us now face. I mean, I hate Boris Johnson. I hate the Conservatives. And I don't like their deal. But I like even less 17 and a half million people being cheated out of the decision that they made both because I also made it, but because even if I didn't, even if I'd voted to remain, I would fear for the future of democracy in the country. If you tell 17 and a half million people, your vote isn't worth anything and we're going to tear it up. Do you see my point? Mark? But at the heart of this is something systemic. The process of democracy or so-called democracy in Britain is broken. And you and I, George, support proportional representation. Yeah. Mm. Because the parties are dishonest from the outset. The Conservative Party is split between the UKIP in exile. The only reason they don't stand for UKIP or Brexit is because they probably wouldn't get elected. And then the One Nation Tories of Cameron. The Labour Party is split between the 172 in the Parliamentary Labour Party who voted against the democratic elected leader of that party yeah, in a vote up. of no confidence mm. in 2016. So that split between Social Democrats, who would really be better off with the uh, yellow Tories and the Lib Dems, and some of them have defected to it, and people like you and I, who are actual socialists. And if you had PR, then maybe socialists would only get 6 or 7% of the vote. But we would have 40 or 50 
MPs in Parliament fighting for socialism. We could be true to that cause. So the system has to change. And that you already have proportional representation for the European elections. Yeah. So why not for and Westminster? The Parliament and, and the Scottish Parliament. Yeah. So it's all wrong. Uh, and of course, what you've got is the Tories being opposed to it, the Labour Party being opposed to it, uh, wanted to keep the rotten first-past-the-post system uh, for selfish reasons. Maybe and I'd make a point the... about class. Well, just before Looking you at do Parliament. I'll, let, I'll yeah. let you do that, but I want you to make this point. Maybe if what the young man thinks uh, as the outcome, another hung parliament, maybe if we get another hung parliament, we might get changes to the electoral system, don't you think? Well, I would hope so, because I was going to make the point on class, which is very important in all of this. Only 5% of MPs come from a manual trade. But, you know, this is a rotten system. Tony Benn used to say to me, we have two-thirds democracy in Britain. I don't think it's even two-thirds. I think it's about 50%. Mm. Uh, uh, back to uh, Ahmed. Just uh, on that point, Mark, I used to say to the Parliament, because I left school at 16 and went to work in a tyre factory, and I used to say to the other MPs, I'm the only MP in here that can make a Michelin ZX radial tyre. Most of you couldn't even change one if you had a puncture <laughs> on the highway. Ahmed. Um, I guess it's a question to you, George, and, and my friend over here as well, because it's a discussion I'm constantly having. When I'm going to protest in support of Venezuela and I'm going to protest in support of Bolivia, I'm mixing with anti-imperialists and they're telling me the same thing over and over again. Why do you bother with the Labour Party? What's the point? You're voting for the lesser of two evils. Mm. And I guess my question to both of you is, I don't actually disagree with most of your criticisms of the Labour Party. And there's many criticisms of Jeremy Corbyn. But do you is, is there not a quantifiable difference between the Labour Party led by Jeremy Corbyn and the Conservative Party led by Boris Johnson. And, that, well, and, and that, that, that's all I want to know. Because, yeah, well, do, good, we just, do we just give up and a, say... a good question, cause, cause but, but just I could turn that around, Ahmed, and yeah. say you're fostering illusions in a Labour Party that will never deliver what it is that you want. Mm. And the longer you do that... Well, we've been doing it for 100 years. Yeah. Uh, th that's th that's one answer to your yeah, question. Sure. Let's hear. Uh, Just from... before I go to him, because yeah. because another argument is that we need to build our own social movement, which I agree with totally. But it's a process. So while we're while we're in the, while we're in that process, do we completely disengage and say Liberal Democrats are rubbish, like you did a bit earlier? Liberal Democrats are middle class this, and the Tories are this, and the Labour Party is this. Completely disengage and don't vote, or do we? Vote for the best out of a bad bunch. Briefly, please, because there's another speaker now. Yeah, watching. I think uh, George has uh, unfortunately taken quite a bit of um, the main thrust, which is we've been doing this for a hundred years, <laughs> and people still think the time. Labour Party <laughs> is salvageable. You can look at their history and look at their record and make up your own mind. Um, and I know there are a lot of good people in the Labour Party. There are a lot of good people supporting the Labour Party. At their core, they're never going to make the changes we need. Uh, and you talk about the need for political change. Um, but one key thing was you said austerity was an ideological question. Unfortunately, it's not. It's, it's the economic system that we live under that is so broken and is one that runs our political system, essentially. So we can never have real meaningful change without changing the economic system as well. Thank you. The gentleman in the back row there. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn's uh, election as uh, the Labour leader uh, four years ago, that brought a lot of hope to myself and many other people. But now I'm worried that that hope could be lost and a little bit is, a lot of it is his own fault well, with this Brexit policy of theirs. If he doesn't end up being Prime Minister next month, does that automatically does that then definitely mean that he will no longer be Labour leader? Or is there a scenario like last time he didn't become Prime Minister, but he still remained leader? I, I, it, would be, and, it would all be down to by how much he lost. Uh, yeah. if, if he were to come as close as he did last time, yeah. he might try and stay on. Uh, but if it was worse than that, his MPs, who are overwhelmingly against him, would have him out the door. And if he is no longer the leader... Um, have we lost hope altogether? Or, uh, have we lost hope again? Or 
uh, would his um, his successor be similar to him, or how? No, uh, how confident no, are you? it can't. The, he or she cannot be similar to him because they've rigged the rules for the election of the next Labour leader in such a way that you have to get the nominations of a specific number of Labour members of Parliament, and no one like Corbyn could ever reach that, uh, that threshold. Yeah. So Labour will move to the right after the general election if they lose. If they win, then Corbyn is Prime Minister and hold on to your hats, that's likely to be quite a bumpy ride. And I'm just talking about inside the Labour Party. <laughs> because, of course, we have a situation where the vast majority, more than two-thirds, in fact, four-fifths, of the Labour members of Parliament do not want Jeremy Corbyn. Because we know that because they've been trying for four years to get rid of him. Now, he was a friend of mine for many decades. He's let me down, he betrayed Mark and, and all that, but I still would prefer to see him in Downing Street than uh, Boris Johnson, of course. But uh, it's my duty to say I don't believe that that looks likely. Yes, yeah, let the Labour man speak. Yeah, I will, I will just take a point that mm. you made regarding Brexit, uh, and that is the 17 million people that voted to 17 leave. And a half. 17 and a half. OK, uh, th thank you for the correction. Uh, and I think you actually do these people disservice when you, when you say that they're not entitled to have a view or change their view, having found out that they'd be lied to uh, in 2016, which made them vote the way they did. I think there is an issue there. We could do that. It after is a responsibility. Every you know, we could rerun well, every election. Well, well but on that, that, is, that is not on any election. This is a referendum, which was brought up by, but brought in by a desperate uh, party, Conservative Party, to stay united. Uh, we all know that it wasn't because Britain wanted it. It was because simply. Uh, 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 the, the Prime Minister at the time, which uh, his name completely... Cameron. I don't want to mention the name. Thank you. So uh, he was the one that brought that, despite the advice that he had from a number of people in his leadership team, not to go for it. And he still went for it. It's decisive, it's divisive, it doesn't help the economy. It, I know your views, and I, and I do respect it. I, I have a lot of friends who voted for Brexit. Uh, and I also have concerns, remember, that actually voted for Brexit. Uh, and, and now they question in themselves, did we make the right decision? Mm. I think the Labour Party now in a position to give them the opportunity uh, to cast their votes. What is wrong? What is wrong with the democracy? You can, no, what uh, is wrong with the wrong with democracy? It. Here's what's wrong with it. You can try again once you've implemented the decision I've already made. You cannot say... The decision I made was so stupid, you're not going to implement it. Well, we didn't say that. We're not saying that. 1974. Essentially, you are. I'm sure that you, were, you, were, you were involved in that in 1974. I was. Like I was. Yeah. I probably I was much younger than you, so... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but not as handsome. So, uh, you know, 1974. You could see the type of a leadership at that time, which kept the Labour Party together. Uh, under Harold Wilson. Yep. There is a lesson that we actually yeah, should no, uh, Harold Wilson's you know, a lesson to many uh, uh, to many. So, uh, I agree yeah, with that. I, I'm much more just against... because it's an international audience, I have to explain this point. In 1973, Edward Heath, the Conservative Prime Minister, took us in to the common market without a referendum. Harold Wilson in 1975 gave us the chance to leave or stay. That's wholly different from this situation in which we were asked, do you want to stay or do you want to leave? And leave one, and it hasn't been implemented. That's my point. I, I accept Once it. it's been implemented, I, I, you I, can I, form a party, the let's go back to the EU party, and you can campaign for votes on that basis. If but I had been a, as young as this young man here and a young lady, I probably would have done. Yeah. But, but I think, and I also, I also, uh, yes, totally support uh, proportional representation. Mm. If we have it in Scotland, why can't we have yeah, it here? Quite. Let's yeah. hear from the, so, the Bruges group. The Bruges group. 
There was overwhelming support, according to the opinion polls. 80% of people wanted the referendum on our membership of the European Union. The Liberal Democrats had been arguing for it since 2007. Remarkably, the Labour yes. Party supported it. They voted for it. Ed Miliband, the Labour leader in 2013, supported a motion to calling for an in-out referendum. There was overwhelming support because for years the British people have been pushed further and further down the road of European integration without having a say and enough was enough and it had gone far too far and the British people finally wanted to have their say and UFR supported it as well because they thought this was so important. It's a key democratic issue but what we've seen since then is the typical European behaviour where they try and ignore or overturn the referendum. So whenever there is a vote in the European Union, a referendum, it is always ignored. It always goes against what the EU wants, whether that's further uh, countries being taken into the euro or various treaties being put into force and they're made to either vote again or ignored. And enough is enough. And if we're talking about having our say and having a proper functioning democracy, then we need to draw a line in the sand and say this will be delivered because we have demanded it and corporate interests which govern how the EU works will not be telling us anymore how to run our own countries and we can make our own policies as we see fit. Well, that's one of the key issues. But if I'd, I'd caution against a system of proportional representation because what we'll find is we'll find European like European st style parties emerging where all the candidates are selected centrally behind closed doors with, who aren't Trust accountable me, they to people. They already are. But we've run. <laughs> but we've they'll run, be making decisions behind closed doors. But we've run at the out moment. Of time. One thing you must conclude from this debate this is the Brexit election. I've been George Galloway. You've been a marvellous audience. Thanks for watching. <laughs>